Today in the workshop, we'll be working with the NRF24L01 transceiver modules. We'll learn how these devices work and how we can use the Radiohead library to communicate between two Arduinos with them. We'll even build a wireless joystick for our robot car. We're working without a wire today, so welcome to the workshop. Hey, welcome to the workshop. Today I'm going to be working with some devices that many of you have asked me about. These are the NRF24L01 transceiver modules. Now for those of you not familiar with these modules, these are little RF transmitter receivers that you can use with microcontrollers like the Arduino or microcomputers like the Raspberry Pi in order to exchange data at a reasonable speed over some fairly reasonable distances. In fact, with the correct antenna, you can even approach a kilometer under the right conditions. Now I'm going to discuss how these modules work and show you a library that we have used before that you can use to communicate communicate with these modules, but I'm also going to show you a project that many people have asked me about, and it's this. You might remember I did a video on the L298N H-Bridge motor controller, and in that video I connected an L298N H-Bridge and an Arduino up to a joystick and used it to drive two motors on a robot car base, and I was able to steer the car by pushing the joystick forward to go forward, pulling it back to go backwards, and when I pressed it toward the side, the car would steer off to that side. Now, in that video, I just wired it directly to the Arduino with a big long wire, but many people have asked about doing a remote control project with that, so today I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to take this little robot car. Now, you might remember that video in which we built a robot car base that had a couple of speed sensors on it. I'm taking this same robot car, I'm adding an NRF24L01 into the system so that I can control this with a remote joystick. And so I'll show you exactly how to build that. So stay tuned, there's a lot to cover today. Now before we start working with the NRF24L01 transceiver modules, I want to say a couple of words about this robot car base. Now for those of you who haven't seen the video, in the robot car base video I showed you how to assemble one of these car bases from an inexpensive little kit. And I also showed you how to use these little speed sensors, these little black discs that come with these kits. We used them with a set of opto isolators in order to send signals to the Arduino, and we use Arduino interrupts in order to measure those signals and measure the speed of the wheels and therefore control the car. So it's a very useful video to watch if you haven't seen it. It'll show you how to use the robot car base and also you'll learn a bit about Arduino interrupts if you're not familiar with that concept already. Now having said that, we are not going to be using the speed sensors in today's design. However, I'm not going to be removing them. If you have seen the video and if you have built the robot car base based on the video, first of all, thank you very much for doing that. But secondly, you should know that I have a couple of wiring changes I needed to make, specifically the changes going to the L298N H-Bridge motor controller. The reason is that some of the pins I used conflicted with some of the pins I needed for the NRF24L01 transceivers. So I had to move some of the wiring around. And I also used a pin that you might not expect me to have used. So you'll be learning another Arduino design technique that you might not know. So if you have built the base, pay particular attention to the wiring changes you're going to need to make. Having said all that now, let's go and learn a little bit about the NRF24L01 RF transceiver modules. The NRF24L01 is an inexpensive radio transceiver module based upon a chip designed by Nordic Semiconductor. It operates in the 2.4 to 2.5 GHz Industrial, Scientific and Medical or ISM band. It connects to external devices using a Serial Peripheral Interface, or SPI, port. It's used in many applications such as wireless mice, remote controls, and many industrial designs. 
There are many configurations of the NRF24L01. Today we'll be dealing with two popular styles. One is a module with an integrated antenna. The other is a module with a low noise amplifier and external antenna for improved performance. Now here are the pinouts of the NRF24L01. Note that I'm showing the module with the internal antenna, but the one with the external antenna has the identical pinouts. This is also the top view of the module. Now pin 1, which is indicated with a square around the pin, is the ground pin. Pin 2 is VCC. This can be any voltage between 1.9 and 3.6 volts. Please note that the NRF24L01 cannot be powered directly with a 5 volt power supply. Pin 3 is the chip enable pin. This is an active high pin, and when it's activated, tells the chip to either transmit or receive, depending upon which mode it is currently in. Pin 4 is chip select not. This is tied to the SPI bus slave select and is an active low pin. When it is activated, it indicates that this particular module has been selected on the SPI bus. Pin 5 is the SCK, or clock pin. This is the clock signal from the master on the SPI bus. Pin 6 is master out, slave in. This is the output from the master, which in our case is the Arduino, or the input to the NRF24L01. Pin 7 is master in, slave out. This is the output from the NRF24L01. Pin 8 is the IRQ, or interrupt pin. This is an active low pin that sends interrupts generated by the NRF24L01. Now as I showed you in the animation, there are a couple of different styles of NRF24L01. I wanted to show them to you on the workbench here right now. This is the standard module that you'll pick up. It's a very inexpensive module, and I'm not sure if you can see this correctly, but over here it's got a very squiggly little line on the printed circuit board that's actually an integrated antenna for the module, so no external antenna is necessary for this. This module is also an NRF24L01. As you can see, it has an external antenna, and that antenna is actually connected. You can remove it if you wish. I'll remove that now. And this uses what's called an SMA connector, which is a standard connector for antennas, so you can connect another antenna to this as well. In addition, you might notice an additional chip on here, and this is the low noise amplifier. What this does is it takes the receiving signal and it amplifies it. It doesn't do anything to the transmitting signal. The transmitting signal is the same as the other module, except it's enhanced by the better antenna. But the receive signal goes through this low noise amplifier, making it a lot stronger, allowing this to communicate more reliably over greater distances. Now this third thing over here I'm going to show you in a moment. It's a very handy little circuit board that you can use when you're working with the NRF24L01. What you do is you plug your NRF24L01 into the connector over here, and then you can use these connectors to go out to your Arduino or Raspberry Pi or whatever it is you happen to be wiring to. The key thing about this board is it also has a 3.3 volt voltage regulator on it, so you power it with 5 volts instead of the 3.3 volts. And as I'll get into it, in a moment there are a lot of advantages to doing this so I would strongly recommend that you pick a couple of these up as well it'll make your life a lot easier now before we begin our experiments I want to give you a few tips for working with the NRF 24L01 because although these modules are very reliable and dependable they can be a bit difficult to get them working at times. And most of those difficulties will boil down to two things, either wiring or power supply. Now wiring simply means you have to make certain that you've got the right connectors going to the right pins on your Arduino. And while that may appear obvious, it often isn't. 
You'll have to remember that different libraries for the Arduino use different pins for the NRF24L01, so you need to pay attention to which library you're using in your code and wire the module accordingly. So if you're trying different sketches that use different libraries, make sure you look at the wiring. Another thing is, if you use one of these adapter devices, which I do recommend, some of them, including the ones I bought, have a mislabeling on them and they've taken the input and the output pin and reversed them. So if you're having trouble to get things to work and you're using one of these devices, check that out. Your input and output pins may just simply be mislabeled and you'll have to reverse the wiring on that. Now, another problem with these devices, though, is power supply. The NRF24L01 uses a 3.3 volt power supply, as opposed to the 5 volt supply you're probably used to using. Now, if you're using one of these modules, it's great because you apply 5 volts to it. It's got an internal voltage regulator and a couple of filter capacitors, and it powers the module perfectly. However, you may be tempted to wire it directly to your Arduino and use the 3.3 3 volt output on the Arduino and in some cases that'll work and in some cases it won't. The reason is many Arduino clones including a lot of Arduino Mega clones do not have sufficient current on the 3.3 volt output. They use a very small voltage regulator and you'll find you have problems running these modules because the transmissions can sometimes take peaks that exceed the value that those devices can provide. Now you can sometimes rectify that problem by putting a filter capacitor directly across the power supply leads on your RF module. Something about a hundred microfarads or so has been proven to work well. But again, I would recommend just using one of these little adapters. You can just wire it up to five volts and aside from that little pin mislabeling, these things work wonderfully and it'll make it so much easier for you to experiment with these modules. And these only cost about a dollar or so. They're not very expensive at all. So having said that, let's get started with our experiments. Now here are the connections for our demonstrations. Note that you will need to build two of these circuits, one to act as a server and one to act as a client. The connections on both are identical. Now we'll start with an Arduino Uno, of course, and I'm going to be using the NRF24L01 adapter. Now, if you aren't using the adapter, you can wire directly to the NRF24L01, but you'll have to pay attention to the power supply connection. So we'll start off with the power supply connection. If you're using the adapter, connect the 5 volts to the 5 volt input on the adapter and the ground to the ground pin. Now, if you're using the NRF24L01 by itself, connect 3.3 volts to the NRF24L01 VCC connection and the ground to the ground. You'll also probably need to use a decoupling capacitor, such as a 100 microfarad capacitor across the power supply line. You may also find that it will work better when it's powered with an external power supply, such as a battery, as opposed to being powered by the USB port if you're not using the adapter. For both the adapter and the NRF24L01, the remaining connections are as follows. The CE pin, which is pin 3 on the NRF24L01, is connected to Arduino Digital I.O. pin 8. The CSN pin, which is pin 4 on the NRF24L01, is connected to Arduino pin 10. The clock pin, which is pin 5 on the NRF24L01, is connected to pin 13. The master out slave in pin, which is pin 6 on the NRF24L01, is connected to pin 11. The master in slave out pin, which is pin 7 on the NRF24L01, is connected to pin 12. Note we are not using the interrupt pin from the NRF24L01 in our experiments. So now that we have two Arduinos wired up to NRF24L01, we're ready to begin our experiments. 
Now you may recall that when I was talking about wiring the NRF24L01 up to an Arduino, I mentioned that the pinouts would be different depending upon which library you chose to use. Now I've wired these up to use the Radiohead library. If you followed my video on using the 433 MHz RF modules, then you've already installed the Radiohead library into your Arduino IDE. But if you haven't, then you're going to need to do that. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. It basically involves just downloading a zip file and installing it from that. Now, Radiohead, not to be confused with the band that wrote the OK Computer album, is a library that was written by Mike McCauley for a company called Airspace, and it's an excellent library for all sorts of RF modules, including the NRF24L01. And the library comes with a number of example sketches, and we're going to be following some of these example sketches. Now, in order to do this, I'm transmitting the vast distance between this workbench over here and this workbench over here. Now this is all of about two meters or so and you could use either of the NRF24L01 modules. You could use these small ones that have the integrated antenna or you could use the ones with the external antenna which is what I've chosen to use. Now even over this distance I found that using these modules with the integrated antenna although they worked fine when I got in between the two modules my body was actually enough to block the signal. And while I'd like to think that might be due to my magnetic personality, it's actually true of any human body, because after all, the human body is mostly composed of water, and water is pretty good at attenuating RF signals. Now, using these antennas, however, I found I could transmit from any two points in my house. So as an example, my workshop is down in the basement, in the very corner of the basement, and I went to the second floor to a room on the opposite corner of the house and had no trouble doing the transmission, going through all the walls and the floors, and also the interference from the um, Wi-Fi router that I've got in the next room, from the Wi-Fi access point I have upstairs, from a number of cordless phones in the house. So it's really quite reliable using these ones with the antenna connection. Now you'll also notice I'm using two computers for these experiments and that's kind of ideal because I've got one for the server and one for the client. Now I realize that many of you won't have two computers but that isn't going to prevent you from doing the experiments. What you'll need to do is compile and download the code individually onto each Arduino and then power them both off of batteries and use your computer to monitor one of the Arduinos and monitor the serial port so you can see what's going on. And So you can do this quite easily with just one computer but because I have a computer on each workbench here I'm going to do that. So let's take a look at our first experiment using the Radiohead library. So first we'll need to install the Radiohead library. Now, as I said, if you had seen the video I did on the 433 MHz RF modules, then you may have installed this library into your Arduino IDE already. But if you haven't, you'll first need to visit the Radiohead webpage and get the library. I have a link to the page in the article associated with this video. Now, at the very top of the page, you'll see a link over here to a zip file with the latest version of the Radiohead library. Click on that and download the zip file to a location on your computer that you're going to remember. Now go into your Arduino IDE and go up to Sketch, go to Include Library, and do Add Zip Library. Navigate to the location where you downloaded your library. And choose the library and click OK. The library has now been added to your Arduino IDE. Now some people say that you need to restart the IDE in order to activate it, but I haven't found that to be true. However, if you have odd results, you might want to give that a try. Now the library itself comes with a number of example sketches, and we're going to use a couple of them one for the receiver and one for the transmitter, or in other words, the server and the client. So let's go and take a look at those sketches right now. Go under File, go to Examples, and then scroll down in Examples until you get Examples from Custom Libraries, and you should see Radiohead. 
Radiohead has a number of submenus, so go to NRF24, and let's take a look at the NRF24 client. Let's expand that a bit. Now the sketch starts off by including a couple of libraries. The SPI library, because as you recall, we will be using the SPI interface to talk to our NRF24L01s. It also includes the Radiohead NRF24 library. We create an instance of that, which we're calling NRF24. <clears throat> In the setup, we set that instance up. So basically, as long as it, it initializes, we'll set it up for a default of 2.402 GHz, which is channel 2, then we'll change that over to channel 1. It's set up to a default data rate of 2 megabits per second and a transmit power of 0 dBm. Now bear in mind that with these modules, if you reduce the data rate, you can increase the distance that you're sending. Now on to the loop. Now recall that this is the client. So we'll go into the serial monitor and we'll say we're sending something to the server and we're going to send the message to the server. Now we'll use an unsigned 8-bit uh, integer in an array called data and we'll set that to the value of hello world. And so that's the data that we're going to do. And so we are going to send that data using a command that sends the data plus it needs to know the size of the data which we just use Arduino size of command to get. So now that the packet has been sent, we wait for a reply. We use the buffer command to get the maximum message length, which I believe is 32 bits minus a few overhead bits, so it works out to be 28 bits. And then we set the length of our buffer to the size of the buffer. Then we wait for a reply. We take a look at the buffer that has that correct length inside it. If we get that, we say got reply, and we print out our reply in the serial monitor. If we don't get a reply after a timeout period, then we'll print receive failed. And so this will happen if the transmitter and receiver are too far from each other, or if, like I said, if you get in the way of the two of them. If we don't get any kind of a reply at all, we'll print this, no reply, is the NRF24 server running. Then we delay the whole thing for 400 milliseconds and start the loop over and over again. So in our serial monitor, we should observe the text that we are sending data and we're waiting for a reply. And if we do get the reply, we'll print it out. So now that we've seen the client side, let's take a look at the server side. So we'll go back into examples. And go back to Radiohead. Oops. Go to NRF24, and we'll do the NRF24 server, the complementary sketch to this one. Now, this will be loaded onto our second Arduino. So it starts off the same way by loading the SPI in the RH NRF24 libraries, and we set up an instance called NRF24. This the setup is exactly the same. We set up our serial monitor and we set up the NRF24. We initialize it and set the value. We change the channel to channel 1. You can experiment by changing these channel numbers, by the way. You may find another channel works better in your location. Just make certain to change the channel on the receiver and the transmitter to match. And after that, it's very similar. We are looking to see if we have a message inside the buffer and if we do have a message we will print got request and we'll print it and then we'll send the reply again we make an array and we say and hello back to you and we send that out as a packet and we print that we have sent the reply if we don't get anything from the other unit we put receive failed over here so load these up to the two Arduinos, and then we'll take a look at the serial monitors and watch our server and client transmit and receive between each other. All right, I've got my demonstration running right now. I've got it on two computers. The computer on this workbench is my server computer, and the computer on this workbench is the client computer. And I've got the two serial monitors up so you can see them as well. And as you can see from the monitors, the server is sending 
a reply and got a request, hello world, sent a reply. The client is saying, sending to NRF24 server, it's got a reply and hello back to you. Or it's asking, is the server running? And it's doing that because I'm blocking the signal with my body. As I mentioned before, that will happen. I'm using the small modules with the integrated antennas, and that's the reason I'm getting these errors. I actually wanted to do this so that I could show you the errors. If I were to substitute these modules, the ones with the long antennas, there doesn't seem to be anything I can do to induce errors. I even tried putting a, a metal pot over the top of the uh, entire circuit board to block the signal, and that wasn't even enough to block out the signal. So these make a very strong signal. So as you can see, this works. We're sending data back and forth between the two devices, um, replying to the data when we get it on this device. And so the first experiment works quite well. So let's move on to another radio head library demonstration. So as you saw with our experiment, using the NRF24L01 with the radio head library is quite a simple thing to do. And you can experiment by taking one side, let's say the server side, and powering it up with a battery and moving it around your home or if you can go outside taking it outside and seeing what kind of range you can achieve if you're using the modules that have the external antenna you can achieve a fairly decent range but even with the other modules you should be able to get at least a couple of meters and you can also experiment with combinations where one unit uses the module with the external antenna and the other unit uses the module with the integrated antenna and see what kind of ranges you achieve in your environment. Now I want to move on to another sketch. You'll probably have noticed there were a few example sketches in the RF24 section of the Radiohead library. And the one I'm going to use this time is called the Reliable Datagram Server and Client. Now what is a reliable datagram? Well consider this, in the sketch we just ran, when one side transmits to the other side, it has no idea if the other side successfully received the result. It just goes and repeats transmitting, but it doesn't know nor does it care whether the other side is actually receiving. And for a lot of applications this is just fine. For example, if you're sending data from a temperature and humidity sensor to a remote location, the temperature and humidity sensor doesn't really care if the remote location received it because it's going to be sending it again in a few seconds anyway so if it dropped off one hopefully it'll pick up the next time but if you're sending critical data such as an actual file such as a video file or something then you need a method so that the transmitting side knows if the receiving side has received the packet successfully and if it hasn't it'll retransmit it in fact if you're watching this on YouTube right now as I suspect you are this is going on on the video that you're watching because the TCP IP protocol that we use on the internet does exactly that. It divides data into packets and sends them and if the packet isn't received by the other end it resends it. Now the reliable datagram uh, server and client experiment does exactly that. It sets up what is called a reliable datagram which has an address for both the client and the server and once one side receives a packet it sends an acknowledgement to the other side to let it know that that packet has been received. If the other side doesn't receive that packet acknowledgement then it resends the packet. So let's take a look at the reliable datagram example very quickly because we're going to build our remote control for our robot car based upon this example. So let's take a quick look at the reliable datagram examples used in the Radiohead library. Now once again we go into file, we go to examples, and scroll down until we see Radiohead, go into NRF24, and we'll look at the reliable datagram client first. Now I'll just quickly go over this to show you some of the differences between this and the two sketches we just ran. Now the first thing is you'll notice is there's an additional library over here. In addition to the two libraries that we ran before, we also take the Radiohead reliable datagram library. Then we define two things, a client address and a server address. Now do not confuse these with channel numbers. These are the addresses used within the datagram packets itself. Then after that we set up an instance of the driver like we did before. And we set up an instance of the reliable datagram 
that we're going to call manager and we set it with the driver and the client address because this is the client side. We'll do the same with the server address in the other sketch. We initialize everything to the default and so we're sending everything on channel 2. Now you could use some of the same elements as the last sketch to change the channel if you wished. And then we basically put some data um, into an unsigned uh, integer array again. We're calling our data hello world. We set up a buffer and we open our serial monitor, send out to the reliable datagram server, and we send the message to the server. Now this is the client side that we're talking about right now. So we use the reliable datagram manager instance, we use a send to wait command, and we send the data to the server address. Then we wait for a reply, as long as the manager receives an acknowledged one, then we print out what the reply is. If we don't get an acknowledged reply, we send out no reply. Now remember, all of the acknowledgement back and forth is handled within the reliable datagram library itself. We don't have the code for it. So the code here is pretty simple. If none of this works, we'll just um, print out that the send to wait failed, that we never received anything. We'll delay for half a second and do it over and over again. Now let's take a look at the server side, which as you can imagine is quite similar. So again, we'll go into examples, We'll go to Radiohead, NRF24, Reliable Datagram Server, which we will run on our other Arduino. Open that up. Once again, we use the same libraries, the same defaults for the client and server address. Set everything up again. Um, we will now be using the server address instead of the client address because we are the server side. Otherwise, the code is basically the same as before. Our message this time is in hello back to you. And if the manager is available, again, we wait for a message from the client. If we receive the message from the client, we'll print the message and then we'll send the message back to the server. If nothing works over here, if this, if this fails, then we'll say send to wait has failed on our, ser on our serial monitor. So we've taken a quick look at this, so now let's take a look at it in action. Okay, time to test a reliable datagram setup. Now once again, this is my server and this is my client, and I'll just get the serial monitor started on the server. And as you can see, the server is getting a request from the client, which is address 1. It's got hello world, and it's sending a reply to the client and hello back to you, which is saying sending to NRF24. And once again, it's bouncing data back and forth. Remember, in this particular case, it's checking to see if the packets of data actually arrived, and if they haven't arrived, it's resending them. So as you can see, the reliable datagram is very reliable, and we will be using the reliable datagram setup in order to build the remote joystick for our little robot car. So having said that, let's move on to the joystick demonstration. Now I realize that many of you are anxious to start working with the remote-controlled robot car, but before we do that, I want to do a demonstration just involving the joystick. The reason for doing this is because I want to illustrate how we can send data using the NRF24L01. Now in the previous demonstrations, the data we've been sending has all been text, like hello world and hello back to you. But I want to show you how you can take data from a sensor and send it over an NRF24L01 using the reliable datagram method in the Radiohead library. And so we're going to connect the joystick and send its values between one Arduino and the other one. So let's take a look at the joystick connections we'll need to make. Now adding a joystick is very simple. We're going to take one of the Arduinos we've been experimenting with and leave the NRF24L01 attached as it was before. We will of course be requiring a joystick. We'll take the VCC from the joystick and connect it to the 5 volt output of the Arduino. We'll take the joystick's ground and we'll connect it to the Arduino ground. 
we'll take the X or horizontal output of the joystick and connect it to analog input A0. And we will take the Y or vertical output of the joystick and connect it to analog input A1. On the other Arduino, of course, we will not be making any changes at all. So now that we've seen how the joystick is hooked up, let's take a look at the sketches we'll be using to demonstrate its operation. So here's the sketch we'll be running on the Arduino which we connected the joystick to. This is based upon the reliable datagram example which we just saw, and you'll notice that a lot of it is very similar, so I won't go into that in too much detail. We start off, as we did before, by including the two libraries from Radiohead, the Reliable Datagram Library and the NRF24 Library, and then we include Arduino's SPI Library because these libraries are dependent upon that. Next, we define the connections we made for our joystick. So joystick X pin is connected to analog 0 input, or A0, and joystick Y pin is connected to A1. Once again, we set up client addresses for the radiogram packet, so client address is 1 and server address is 2. And we create an instance of the radio driver, as we did before. Now we set the radio driver to the client address, so we call it radio manager, set it to radio driver with our client address. And now here's the key to sending some data. We are going to send the data within an array. So we define an unsigned 8-bit array, which I'm calling joystick, and I'm giving it three elements. One is going to be for the x-axis reading, one is going to be for the y-axis, and the third one in this sketch is sort of a dummy one. It's just there to show you how you can send some additional data. But in the final project, the one with the remote controlled car, we will be using the third byte in order to send direction data. Then, once again, this is identical to the reliable datagram example. We define the message buffer. Now we go into our setup. We'll set up our serial monitor, and we initialize the radio manager, and we're using the default channel 2, 2 megabit per second, 0 dBm. Now we go into the loop. And then the loop will start off the serial monitor by printing out that we're reading the joystick values. And then we're going to get those joystick values and put them into the elements of the array. And we do this as follows. Joystick 0, which is the first element of the array, is going to be the value of an analog read from the joystick X pin. So this is the x-axis. Now this will give us a value from 0 to 1023 because it's a 10-bit analog to digital converter. So we're using the map command to map the value of 0 to 1023 to a value of 0 to 255. So joystick 0 will end up being a value of 0 to 255 depending upon where we have the joystick positioned. Joystick 1 is the same thing for the y-axis. And joystick 2, as I said, we're just using a dummy value. So I just put 100 in there. You could use any value from 0 to 255, and that would be fine. We're just going to constantly send that value to show how we send yet another value of data. Then some more stuff for the serial monitor. We're just going to print those values, the joystick 0 and joystick 1 values, so we can watch them and compare them to the rel results we get on the other end. And then the rest of this is very similar to the reliable datagram server example we saw. The key over here is that when we are sending the packet, we are sending it with joystick. Joystick is the variable, and you remember that this is an array that contains all of our data. So this is the key over here, is to define an array and then to send the array over here. The rest of this is identical to what we saw in the reliable datagram server example. We'll print out the reply we get from the other end. Uh, if we don't get anything, we'll ask if that other server is running. And uh, then we go through the loop and do it all over and over again, reading the joystick values, printing them out in our serial monitor, and sending the array with joystick values to the other end. So now let's take a look at that other end. This was the transmitter side. So now let's go and take a look at the receiver side. Now the receiver side is just about identical to the reliable datagram example. In fact, there's only a couple of little modifications we've made to it. 
And so uh, we basically start off by including the libraries that are required, defining the addresses for the client and server side within the radiogram, setting up the instances that we set before. Right now we're setting this to the server address because this is the server side. Um, and a message that we are going to be returning if we get valid data, and in this case is joystick data received. We define the message buffer, and now we go into the setup. In setup, we start our serial monitor and we initialize the radio manager again with the same defaults we did on the other side. Now we go into the loop and if the radio manager is available, we wait for the message and we get the message inside the buffer and then we go and print it. And this is where you'll see how we extract our data. The buffer now contains an array. So the X value is going to be the buffer value zero. The Y value is going to be buffer value 1, and the Z value, and the Z value is just a value that uh, we used uh, as a dummy value, 100 in this particular case, so the Z or Z as you prefer value is going to be buffer number 2. And then we'll send our message back to the originator saying that we've received it, and then we go through the loop and do it all over and over again. So we'll load our sketches onto our two respective Arduinos, and we'll take a look at this working in action. All right, I'm running the demo right now. I've got the joystick on this side, and I've got the receiver end on this side, and we'll bring the serial monitors up so you can see the values on both monitors and observe what happens when I move the joystick around. Now, on both Arduinos, I'm using the modules, the NRF24L01s that have the integrated antennas, not the ones with the external antennas. But when I do build the robot car, I'm going to switch to the models with the external antennas because I want to get better performance and I don't want to get the dropouts that we'll occasionally get on uh, the setup I've got right now. So observe what happens when I move the joystick. I'm going to move the x-axis first. and I've moved the x-axis all the way up to one end right now. And as you can see, the x-axis value right now is 254, 255. And you can see that on both sides. Now I'm going to move it down. And the x-axis is dropped to 0. The y-axis is pretty steady in the center. Now I'll work with the y-axis. I've moved it to the middle again. Moving the y to one side right now. And y is equal to 0 on both ends. I'll move y to the other end, and y is equal to 255 right now. You'll notice the z, or z if you prefer, value is always set at 100, and that's because I used a constant of 100, and so that's the only value being transmitted. But what this illustrates is how we can send data from a sensor, in this particular case the sensor being a joystick, between two devices using an NRF24L01 and the Radiohead Reliable Datagram Library. So now that we've covered that, there's nothing left to do except actually put together our remote-controlled robot car. So let's take a look at what we need to do to do that. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I'm going to be using the robot car base that I used in a previous video, the one in which I showed you how to use the speed sensors. And you may want to take a look at that video if you want to assemble a similar robot car base. You could actually use any base, though. It doesn't have to be this one, as long as it's got two wheels and a base to hold the Arduino and a place to hold some batteries and the L298N motor controller. You could really use any base that you wanted to, but I'm basing this project around the last one. Now, the last project used a couple of speed sensors uh, in order to sense the wheel rotation. They aren't going to be used in this project, but if you did build the last project, don't remove them or unwire them. We're just not going to make use of them right now. Now, one thing about this uh, car base, if you have built the previous one, is that you're going to need to make some wiring changes, specifically to the L298N motor controller. A few of the wires on that conflicted with the wires I needed for the NRF24L01. So pay attention to the schematic diagram that I'm about to show you in order to see what those wiring changes are. Another thing you might notice is that I've used the style of NRF24L01 that has the external antenna, and I did that for reliability. You could 
use the other one if you wanted to but I think it's far more reliable to use these especially if you want to drive your car a reasonable distance and I also did this on the joystick side now for the joystick side of things there are no changes to make from our previous experiment so just leave your joystick wired up to the Arduino and again on that side I replaced the NRF 24L01 with one of these ones with the external antenna you could do that as well if you wish for the optimum performance so now that we've talked about this car base, let's take a look at the wiring we're going to have to use in order to wire all of this up. And then I'll show you the sketches we're going to use. And then finally, we'll actually drive it around the room. Here's what we'll need to get our car base running. We'll need an Arduino Uno, an L298N H-Bridge motor controller, the NRF24L01. Now I'm showing an adapter and I strongly recommend that you also use the adapter. It'll make things so much easier with its onboard voltage regulator. However, you could use the NRF24L01 on its own if you insist. You'll also need a couple of DC motors. Mine are rated at 6 volts DC. You'll need a power supply for those motors that is about 1.4 volts higher than the motor rating. This compensates for the voltage drop in the L298N. I'm using a 7.5 volt supply consisting of five AA batteries. I also used a 9 volt battery to power the Arduino, although you could use another power supply for the Arduino if you wish, such as a USB power bank. Now here's how we're going to wire all of this up. We'll run the 5 volts from the Arduino to the 5 volt input on the L298N. We also run the 5 volts up to the 5 volt input on the NRF24L01 adapter. Now if you're using an NRF24L01 by itself, then you'll need to supply it with 3.3 volts instead. Do not connect 5 volts directly to an NRF24L01. The ground from the Arduino will go to the ground of the L298N and the ground of the NRF24L01. We'll connect our 7.5 volt power supply to the high voltage input on the L298N. We'll connect both of our motors to the L298N. The connections of the NRF24L01 are identical to what they have been in our previous experiments. Pin 3, the chip enable of the NRF24L01, will go to pin 8 of the Arduino. Pin 4, the chip select not of the NRF24L01, will go to pin 10 of the Arduino. Pin 5, which is the clock input of the NRF24L01, will go to pin 13 of the Arduino. Pin 6, which is the master out serial in, will go to pin 11 on the Arduino. And pin 7, which is the master in serial out, will go to pin 12 on the Arduino. Now we'll connect our L298N. Notice if you use the previous project, that some of these connections will be different. The Enable A line on the L298N will go to pin 9 on the Arduino. Now input 1 of the L298N will actually connect to analog input A0. This is not an error. Input 2 of the L298N will connect to Arduino output number 4. Input 3 of the L298N will connect to Arduino output number 7. Input 4 of the L298N will connect to Arduino pin number 6. And the Enable B line on the L298N will connect to Arduino Digital I.O. pin 5. Finally, the 9-volt battery will connect to the coaxial power input on the Arduino Uno. And that's the wiring for our robot car base. Now let's take a look at the sketches we'll be using for both the joystick and the car base. We'll begin by looking at the sketch for the joystick side of our remote controlled car. 
Now this is very similar to the sketch we saw during the joystick demonstration, and it's been amalgamated with a sketch that I did when I did the L298N motor controller video, where I drove the car with a joystick, but in that particular case it was disconnected with a wire. So I've used a lot of the same code I used to determine forward and backward direction by using the joystick, and those of you who saw that video will probably notice that code within this code. So we start by including our Radiohead libraries and the dependent SPI library. Then we define the connections we've made to our joystick, A0 and A1. We also define a couple of integers to hold those joystick values. Now remember, the Arduino uses a 10-bit analog to digital converter, so these values will end up from 0 to 1023. So 512 pretty well puts it in the middle position. We define the address for the radio channels and again connect, create an instance of the radio driver and we set the radio driver to the client address. Then we declare an array that we're going to be using to hold the data that we're going to be sending to the car. Now we have three bytes declared, so it's a three element array. Two of the bytes are going to be the values of each of the motor speeds. And the third byte is going to be the motor direction, whether we're going forwards or backwards. And then we define the message buffer as we did earlier. Now in this setup, we set up a serial monitor, which we can use to monitor on this side to see what our joystick values are and to troubleshoot if anything is going wrong and initialize the radio manager again. We also set the initial motor direction as forward. So in our array, motor control element two defines the direction. A 0 equals forward and a 1 will equal reverse. So we set this up as a 0 to set our motors going forward initially. Now we start off our loop by printing to the serial monitor, so reading motor control values. We send that up there. And then we actually read those values. So we assign joy pause vert and joy pause hors to the analog read values of the two pins, the two analog pins. Now this will give them a value again of 0 to 1023. Now we need to determine if it's a forward or backward motion, and we do it by reading the vertical value. If we're pressing the vertical uh, toward the top, then we're going forward. If we're pulling it back, we're going in reverse. So we want to leave a little bit of leeway because none of these joysticks is absolutely perfect. So if the joy pause vert is less than 460, we're pulling back on it. We're saying this is going backwards. So we'll set the motor direction as backwards. Motor control 2 now equals 1. Um, if it's, I'll get to this bit in a, in a moment, but I just want to show you if it's joy pause vert is over 564, then we're going forwards and we'll set motor control to forward. And if it's in the middle, then motor control is stopped. And also all of the variables are set to zero because the motor stopped and we just set the, uh, the direction as forward again. Okay, so back in here, if we're going backwards, we want to determine the speed. So we take these two variables, motor control one and two, and we map them to the speed. Now, since we're going in reverse, we're doing the mapping in reverse. So we're looking for values from 460 down to zero and mapping them in reverse from zero to 255. Now, if we're going forward, we do the opposite. We take the values from 564 to 1023 and map them to a range of 0 to 255. Okay, now for the steering, we do a similar thing. Again, we establish 460 and 564 as the two limits, and anything in between just means the joystick's in the middle. And we're going to pad the motor control values that we had earlier. So again, we're going to use a map command. Now, if we're going left, we're reversing the, the reading. So again, from 460 down to 0, we go 0 to 255. And then on motor control 0, we're going to minus that value from motor control 0 to slow down that motor. And motor control 1, we're going to add that value to speed the motor up. And this way, our car can steer to one side. Now, we also want to make sure that we don't exceed 255 or go below zero. So these statements take care of that. 
Now, if we push the joystick in the other direction, we do exactly the same thing, only in reverse. We're going to map 564 to 1023, from 0 to 255, and the math here is just backwards from the math in the previous section. And again, we make sure we don't exceed, exceed the range of 0 to 255. Now, this I just added at the end as I found any motor control value from 1 to 8 would cause the motors to make a buzzing sound. So if the motor control value is less than 8, we already know it can't go below 0, then we'll just set it to 0. We're going to display those values in the serial monitor, and then the rest of this is identical to the joystick demonstration sketch that we did. We're going to send motor control out in our packet and we're going to see if we got a response from the other end. Now at the end over here I want to mention this delay. There's a delay over here to allow everything to take care of itself before we do the next transmission. And you can experiment with this delay. You might find a little bit of latency in this system. And you can reduce that to a degree by reducing the value of this delay, but you can only reduce it so much before you actually start to see transmissions drop off and everything because you're basically sending the data too fast. So I urge you to experiment with this number if you want to. So now that we've seen the transmitter side, let's jump over and look at our receiver side. So here's the receiver side, the side that's going to run on the robot car itself. Now again, we start everything off identically to before with the same libraries and defining the client addresses. We also need to define the connections to the two motors. Now, motor A is rather interesting. Enable A is just line number 9. And the enables, by the way, both have to be on lines that the Arduino is capable of pulse width modulation on. So pins 9 and pin 5 are capable of PWM, and they weren't being used by the NRF24L01. You recall I had to change the connections from motor A from the original design, while motor B stayed the same. Now this one might strike you as odd. Uh, I have pin 14 here, and those of you who know the Arduino Uno will say, well, wait a second, it only goes to digital pin 13. This is where I use the analog zero pin, because the analog pins, as it turns out, can also be used as digital pins. And analog 0 is pin 14, analog 1 is pin 15, analog 2, pin 16, etc., etc., up to pin 19 on an Arduino Uno. You could also have put A0 over here, and you might want to do that if you're going to build your, your car with something other than an Arduino Uno, just because the pin numbers might be different. Also keep remembering, if you're using an Arduino Mega, there is actually a pin 14 you could have connected to. But pin 14 is the same as analog zero, so I just wanted to point that out. So we basically define the connections to the motor. Once again, we're doing the same thing as we did before, creating an instance of the radio driver and setting it up for the server address, which is uh, transmitting us our, our joystick data. And we have a receive message that we could send back, joystick data received. Um, in future videos, I'm going to show you other data that we can send back from our remote control car. But for now, we're just going to send this message just so the other end knows we've received something. And we set up the message buffer as we did before. Now we set up a serial monitor over here. Now, in normal operation, of course, you won't have a serial monitor connected to your car. So this is just for troubleshooting purposes. And you could eliminate the serial commands later on in the final design, if you wish. We also need to set up all of the pins that we're using as outputs. So we do that. And we initialize the radio manager as before. Okay, now in the loop. Now if the radio manager is available, we wait for a message and make sure we get it into the buffer, the same as we did in the last demo. Now you might notice all of these have been remarked out right now. This is just for troubleshooting purpose, because again, you normally won't have a serial monitor connected to the car, and I wanted to eliminate these statements in the final code because they're just kind of pointless and they take up CPU cycles that you could be using for driving your car. But if you have trouble getting this to work, just um, 
take the remark statements off of these ones over here and look at everything while you're connected to the serial monitor to make sure you're actually getting data from the joystick. So we're going to look for buffer uh, number two in our in our array. It's a three three bit array, and number two indicates the motor direction. As you recall, one is backwards and zero is forwards. So if it's equal to one, we set our motors backwards by writing to these four pins on the L two ninety eight N to set everything to go backwards. If it's not one, then it must be zero. So we're going to set everything forward. And then after that, it's a simple matter of driving the motors. We drive the enable lines with the analog write commands, with buffer 1 for A and buffer 0 for B. And we'll send the return message back and keep going through the loop over and over again. So actually, the receive side is relatively simple when compared to the transmit side. So now that you've seen both of these sketch, let's go and take a look at our robot car in action. And so now, finally, the moment you've been waiting for. The robot car with the remote joystick is ready to test out. Now, I've got it here in the workbench. I'm going to lift it off of the workbench so it doesn't start driving all over the place and careening off the workbench and destroying itself. But let's just check to make sure the motors are actually working. So I'll push the joystick forward. And my motors move. I pull it backwards. and they move in the other direction. I'll push it all to one side. I have one motor moving. The other side. The other motor's moving. So it looks like it's functional, but of course the true test is to give it a drive. So I'm going to put it down on the floor and do exactly that. Well, at last we've made it to the end of the video, and I know this has been a particularly long video, so if you have made it all the way through this video, I must congratulate you. I think you actually deserve some sort of reward. Now, hopefully that reward is that you now know how to use the NRF24L01 radio modules, and by combining them with the Radiohead library and some Arduinos, you've got all sorts of remote control projects that you're dreaming up, and that's a pretty good reward in itself. Now, I would really urge you, if you haven't already, to subscribe to the channel. It would mean a lot to me, and would also mean that you would get notification every time I make a new video. And I've got lots of new videos planned for you, so stay tuned for those. So in the meantime, take care of yourself, enjoy your robot cars, and I'll see you again very soon here in the workshop. Goodbye for now.